This video is the first of a series on production functions. I will describe the basic properties and the intuition of such production functions and I will illustrate them graphically. Most economic models consist of two main parts. One is the consumption side, where households buy consumption goods and maximize their utility and so on. And the other is the production side, in which firms produce the consumption goods that households buy. And uh, the main part in the uh, description of the production side is the production function that relates output of the firms, YT, to the inputs of these firms according to a certain functional form uh, F. What does this mean? Typically, the firms have production factors at their disposal. Physical capital typically denoted by K, labor denoted by L, and these two production factors are rival. That means that if one firm uses them, another firm cannot use them at the same time. So if firm one uses a production hall and the assembly line in it, then another firm cannot use the same production hall and the same assembly line at the same time. And the same holds true for workers. If one firm employs uh, workers and they produce in um, their shift, then another firm cannot use the same workers at the same time. And the last part of this production uh, function here, AT, is a catch-all variables for non-rival inputs. Typically, uh, it's productivity A, by which the firm can use capital and labor to produce output. And this is typically determined by the knowledge and the technology that is available in a country. So if the stock of knowledge is higher, then physical capital and labor are more productive in producing output. Now, in the basic version of most models, AT is assumed exogenous to a single firm. That means that one firm alone cannot drive the technological frontier of a country. But in more complex economic models, the evolution of AT is endogenized in the sense that firms invest in their technologies such that they gain an edge of their competitors. But we abstract from this for the moment and normalize A to 1. Now, how does such a function look like? Up to now, we've said nothing about the shape of this production function and how production inputs can be transformed into outputs. Now, I will put a little bit of structure on the production function. And this is the structure that is typically used in most economic models, the structure of a so-called neoclassical production function. What does this mean? Basically, it means that the production function fulfills three properties. The first one is that it has constant returns to scale with respect to the rival input factors in production. Now, what does this mean mathematically? It means that if I increase the employment of both rival production factors by a certain factor lambda, then also output increases by this factor lambda. Intuitively, it means, for example, if lambda is 2, that I build the same firm on the uh, other side of the street again, and then I can produce twice the output. So that makes intuitive sense. So if I double the inputs in production, the rival inputs in production, I can also double output. The second property is that there are positive but diminishing marginal products of both rival production factors that we have, capital and labor. What does this mean? Well, it means nothing else than if I hold one production factor constant and I increase the other, then I can increase production. That's the positive marginal product. But the additional output that I get by increasing one production factor more and holding the other constant, that decreases. And intuitively, it makes sense. If you think about a firm that employs capital and labor, to produce, say, cars, and the capital is the assembly line, and the workers um, are the ones working on the assembly line, assume that you um, let the assembly line uh, fixed, so let capital be fixed, and you increase the number of workers. Then, initially, this increase leads to a situation where you can have a second shift at the same assembly line, perhaps even a night shift, a third shift, and you can increase output, and so on and so forth. But at some point, 
the assembly line gets crowded, right? So you don't have additional assembly lines. So if you hire additional workers, then you may be able to compensate if one worker falls ill and so on and so forth. But for ever increasing workers, the additional output that you get out of it uh, decreases. And we will see in the next property that this the additional output goes to zero if I only increase one production factor. And the same holds true, of course, if I hold uh, the number of workers fixed and I increase um, uh, physical capital. Because there, for example, if you have a thousand workers and you introduce one assembly line, then you can produce a lot of additional output. If you introduce a second assembly line, it may be the case, for example, if one assembly line is closed due to maintenance, you can still produce. And that means also additional output as compared to the situation where you only have one assembly line. But if you add assembly lines without hiring new workers, then the additional output that you get becomes smaller and smaller. And in the limit, it would be zero. Now, mathematically, this means that the derivative of the production function, the partial derivative with respect to one production factor is positive. That's the positive marginal product. But the second derivative is negative. So the increase in production decreases. And that holds true for capital, which is the first line here, but also for labor, which is the second line here. I've already said that uh, in the limit, the additional capital or additional labor that I employ holding the other production factor fixed would not add anything to output anymore. And actually this leads to the third property that a neoclassical production function uh, fulfills and that's the in other conditions. What uh, do these in other conditions tell us? They tell us that the limit of the partial derivative of the production function with respect to capital or labor goes to zero if employment of this particular production factor tends to infinity, holding the other production factor constant. So that's the first block here. Intuitively, it's nothing else than if you employ ever more capital without expanding your workforce, then the additional output that you can produce tends to zero. That's what I said before. If you add assembly lines on and on without increasing the workforce, then at some point the additional assembly lines will not increase output anymore. And of course, the same effect holds true if I only employ additional workers. I have one assembly line and I hire more and more workers. Then initially I may be able to produce more, but at some point I have so many workers that cannot really use the assembly line anymore in a meaningful way and therefore additional employment would not increase output anymore. So that's this block of the other conditions. But there is also the other block that's when one production factor goes to zero. What happens then? And here the other conditions tell us that then the marginal product of this production factor goes to infinity. What does this mean? Basically, it means if I have a firm that has an assembly line, but no workers at all, then I cannot produce. So the first worker I hire is infinitely productive. It increases production from zero to a positive amount. And that means the slope of the production function at that point is infinity. So the first worker is very productive. It increases output by a lot. And the same holds true, of course, um, of capital. So if I um, have no capital but workers, then the first assembly line that I add increases output by a lot. Now I summarize again the intuition of these properties. The first is the constant returns to scale means that if I build the same firm again on the other side of the street, this doubles output. So that's intuitive. The positive but diminishing marginal product means that if I have a firm with one assembly line but no workers, and if I increase employment, then output rises strongly initially, but the additional output decreases whenever more workers operate the line. So when the number of workers increases, but the physical capital stock stays constant, additional output decreases and decreases until when the other conditions are fulfilled, as the number of workers goes to infinity, additional output goes to zero. So the other conditions mean that the first unit of physical capital or labor allows production and therefore increases output um, by an infinite amount, but additional output converges to zero when one production factor becomes overly abundant. Altogether, the bottom line here is that these assumptions are actually not unrealistic. So they are typically um, 
fulfilled for standard uh, ranges of production factors and so on and so forth. And from a modeling perspective, they ensure an interior unique equilibrium. So therefore, they are useful from, mod from the modeling perspective, but from an intuitive perspective, they are also not completely unreasonable. How does such a production function look like? What I've done here is to plot a production function with two inputs, capital on this x-axis here and labor on the y-axis, and output would be on the z-axis um, here as a combination of the two inputs. What we see here is that, of course, at the origin, when we don't have any labor and we don't have any capital, nothing can be produced. But even if we have capital, so along this axis, but no labor, we still cannot produce anything. So here along this line, output is still zero. And the same holds true along the y-axis here, when we don't have physical capital, but labor. But if we move here in the interior for capital and labor both increasing, then output increases. If we um, go along this uh, line here, actually, when we increase capital and labor one for one, then we would see this constant returns to scale argument. So if we um, double both input factors, then we also double output. And then the question is what happens if I hold one production factor constant and increase only the other one? And that's basically that we cut the production function from one side. So for example, if we hold labor constant and only change capital, then we would have a cut of this production function here, for example, along this uh, line, and this is illustrated on the next slide. And the same holds true if we hold capital fixed and change labor, then we would have a cut here in the production function along one of uh, these lines. So as said before, I now plot the production functions holding one of the production factors constant. So then I have essentially a two-dimensional projection of the three-dimensional production function here in the first diagram uh, holding labor fixed and changing capital there I have output and in the second diagram holding capital fixed and changing labor now what we see is of course if we don't have any capital for a constant amount of labor we cannot produce the first unit of capital that we employ increases production tremendously but then the curve starts to flatten off and as k goes to infinity, it would become flatter and flatter and flatter and in the limit becomes zero. And the same holds true with respect to L, holding k fixed. So here I increase employment, but holding the number of assembly lines or whatever fixed. So the first unit of employment increases output quite a lot, but then it starts to decrease and slowly level off. What we also see here is that uh, there is a certain difference between uh, these two production functions or partial production functions, if you will, because the one with respect to capital levels are faster than the one with respect to labor. And that's just the assumptions that I've put in in terms of parameter values for this production function. We will see this later on when we capture in part two and part uh, three uh, specific production functions like the CES production function first and then the special cases of the CES production function, where CES stands for a constant elasticity of substitution production function. So overall, to summarize here, what we observe is actually the in other conditions. So we observe that the marginal product with respect to capital and the marginal product with respect to labor is positive, but diminishing. And we observe the in other conditions, at least at the origin, where output is zero, and then if we increase one production factor, we can increase output quite a lot. And the first in other condition we've seen when considering the production function that, um, in the three-dimensional case, where if we increase both production factors, then we can also increase output by the same amount as the increase in the two production factors.